thanks for having me today. Uh, this has been really uh, interesting so far. I mean, there's just so much going on in South Africa. Um, the dynamics are playing out right in front of our eyes um, as we see this intersection of politics and technology development and, uh, you know, demographics. I mean, it's just, it's a really interesting uh, experience being here now. Um, I must say what's interesting about that joke is that I'm a lawyer. Um, <laughs> so maybe I'm heading in the right direction here. Um, so I wanted to start today by just introducing a little bit about Power Africa. Um, I, just out of curiosity, I always do this. How many of you are familiar with Power Africa? Can I just see a show of hands? Okay, a few of you. I imagine if I asked those of you who raised your hands if you could explain what Power Africa is, uh, you might be able to get some of it right. Uh, it's a little bit of a, of, of a complex thing. But let me just explain it to you. It's a U.S. government initiative that's aimed at doubling access to power in sub-Saharan Africa by the year 2030. So that represents about 300 million people that we're trying to get electricity to in sub-Saharan Africa by the year 2030. We do this with a partnership approach, starting with a partnership of U.S. government agencies. There are 12 of us being led by USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development. So I'm actually a USAID employee. So we are helping to coordinate this effort. It's bringing together all of the, the financial resources, the technical resources, the, 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 the programming resources of those agencies to help tackle this problem. But it doesn't stop there. It also includes 18 other donor partners. And we're, we're adding more uh, all the time. But right now we have 18 donor partners like uh, the UK, the, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Swedes, the Norwegians, and then some of the big uh, multilateral institutions like the World Bank and the African Development Bank. So we share information and collaborate and coordinate with them. We will provide funding to some of them and they'll provide funding to us in terms of uh, different projects so that we can utilize most efficiently our resources in these different markets around uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And then on top of that, we have about 150 plus private sector partners that we have signed MOUs with that have become part of this movement where we're all trying to work together, we're sharing information, we're making introductions, we're listening to them and hearing what their challenges are. Because what we want to do at the core in terms of bringing power to everyone on in Sub-Saharan Africa is we want the private sector to do that. We want the private sector to be able to do that. That's the only way this will ultimately be sustainable. Now, obviously, there's a role for government. There's a role for these utilities. There's a role for regulators. Um, transmission and distribution oftentimes is, is the purview of the state. Um, but we're trying to find ways to bring the, power, the private sector in so that the investment that is waiting in the wings around the world to find a way to get into Africa can be unleashed and be brought here to help make things happen. So we have, with this goal, um, in terms of quantification, 30,000 megawatts and 60 million connections is what we're going after by the year 2030. So far, we've, um, we've helped reach financial close about a little over 10,000 megawatts. And we're about, on a connections basis, about 13 or 14 million. Um, most of those are off-grid. So we're right now redoubling our efforts to focus on on-grid connections. Um, we have, in terms of the topic today, we have a, a, a team that is focused on um, off-grid. And, and it sort of sits in a, in a hybrid space between off-grid and grid. We have teams that focus on both of those areas. Um, but our Beyond the Grid team has its own goal of about 20 to 30 million connections. And so they are working across the continent with partners of every kind to try and figure out how they can help mostly rural customers get access to power. And we're talking people who've you know, never had access and there's no hope for the grid 
getting to their neighborhood anytime soon. So this is, in, you know, in these far reaches of these countries, trying to introduce these, these homes and small businesses to, you know, small-scale solar, even starting with solar lanterns. All right, we, we have one particular activity that is just starting with that to help get some light into people's homes. These, uh, this team is very active, um, and they're working not just on the, uh, with solar home system private uh, sector companies, but also a lot of mini-grid companies. Um, in one of the things they're seeing, though, is even though we've been focusing on the off-grid uh, in these rural areas, we're seeing a lot more embedded generation. We're seeing this trend of a lot of people in the urban and peri-urban areas who are under the grid <coughs> starting to reach out for their own solar home system or mini-grid developers coming in um, next to a grid um, to sort of to sort of extend it or to reach out to it. And so we're, we're seeing that and we're exploring different options for how we can leverage that and, 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 and help ultimately people get access to higher levels of power, however that comes. Um, in terms of this, this space again, like I said, with the with solar home systems, we're seeing this trend of the, you know, the falling cost of, of these systems, uh, their increasing availability, their proven reliability. We, we are seeing this as an inevitable trend. I mean, it is going to happen. You know, people are turning to this as, um, as a viable option to offset grid issues and also to introduce themselves to power. Uh, I have a friend of mine who bought a, a stand out east of uh, Pretoria, and his goal is to be completely self-sufficient. And he doesn't have a um, solar panel yet, but he's working on getting one so that he can be completely off the grid. Um, this is a trend, and not everyone's going to be in his situation, but this is going to be happening. So we have to as regulators, governments, in the private sector, we have to recognize that this is the case. Um, no longer can, I think, governments be fighting against this. We've got to figure out how to leverage it and how to benefit from it. Some um, research suggests that right now in the solar home system market, they are selling about three million products per year. This is in sub-Saharan Africa. And in the last five years, solar home system companies have raised approximately a billion dollars in, in capital to increase their, their business reach. Um, one of the things that we uh, are seeing, there are utilities around the continent that, that are utilizing smart, um, smart meters. We're seeing more and more of this, but most of the utilities are still not there yet. Um, but that is going to be a, a big step. And we have some programs around the continent that are working with utilities on trying to, to accommodate smart meters and to sort of build them in and to get those meters out to customers so they can move away from estimated billing to sort of help increase the confidence level of, of, of customers. Um, in terms of mini grids, um, a little bit you know, on the margins of what we're talking about today, but, but it's relevant. Um, there are a lot of questions around mini-grid viability. We're doing some pilots to try and see how these mini-grids can work profitably. In fact, uh, about three weeks ago, I was in Uganda, and we have a, a program called the Smart Communities Coalition that is working with refugee camps in Uganda and Kenya where we're trying to... Um, help some mini-grid companies get into these refugee camps so that they can test out their business models in a, an environment that is highly densely populated, that doesn't have access to power, and who don't have a lot of spending power. So we're exploring different ways to help support them in developing these business models. 
one of the things we did was help to de-risk some of that by providing some grants that they can use to, to cover some of their capital in, in investing in these, uh, these camps. That's just getting underway on a pilot basis. And we're, we're working with uh, these mini-grid companies across the continent, but all of them need some sort of de-risking support or subsidization at this point because the costs are, are still quite high. Um, there's a lot of regulatory and legal uh, work that needs to be done in terms of the frameworks to accommodate mini-grids in most countries. Uh, like I said, there's, there's financing issues, there are business model issues that all have to be worked out before they can really be embedded into these larger uh, distribution systems. And then you ask the question, well, what, what happens, you know, if a mini-grid has set up and the grid does arrive, then what, right? Is the, is the utility, are the regulators, uh, have they thought that through? Can they, can they incorporate that mini-grid? Um, does the mini-grid operator simply move the assets to a little bit further away from the, the grid and just start over again um, in a new location? Do they become a distributor uh, within the utility? or an IPP that feeds power into the grid. Most jurisdictions in Sub-Saharan Africa really haven't dealt with this, and there's really no clear regulatory regime. There is one example, though. Uh, in Nigeria, they have actually put in regulations to accommodate this, and they're, they're taking steps recognizing that with their own limitations of their utilities and of their, the reach of their grid, many grids pose a viable uh, additional asset that they can utilize. And so they're, they're making uh, efforts to, on a regulatory and policy front, to actually accommodate that. The other thing to, to keep in mind with mini-grids, the benefits that they can provide is, if a mini-grid can get out there and establish a customer base, a base that is used to paying for power, they become used to having power, when the grid gets there, they're going to be better customers, right? They're, going to be, they're not going to be surprised when the utility wants to charge them for that power. Um, they'll be used to it, and they will have appliances and things that need power, so they will want to become customers. So I think it's in our interest to be thinking about mini grids um, as a way to sort of help in the expansion of the grid ultimately. And then finally, on the commercial and industrial uh, standpoint, the CNI space, uh, South Africa has about 50 megawatts right now of installed capacity in the CNI space, uh, according to my, my team. And the rest of sub, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has about 74 megawatts of installed capacity. So South Africa, by far, has the lion's share of that. Uh, most of the CNI uh, systems that are out there are, are with the mining space. And it's interesting, if you look at CEC up in Zambia, that's sort of like an embedded, not an embedded generation, it's like an embedded whole utility that they've developed to support just those, the mining sector up in Zambia. They're expecting in just this year, in 2019, another 100 megawatts in, in Sub-Saharan Africa to be uh, brought online in the CNI space. So it is growing very, very rapidly. In terms of what Power Africa is doing to support this, uh, we have teams of experts operating around the continent who are providing assistance on transactions. They're transaction advisors. They're also providing business advisory support. They're providing, in some cases, uh, introductions to financiers, to sponsors, to other investors, um, legal support, technical assistance, sort of across the board to, uh, to companies of all sorts. We are even providing a lot of that support to regulators, to utilities, depending on where they are and what, what their needs are, so that we can bring both sides together to make things work. One of the things that we, that we have um, is, uh, as an example, there's a program that we're running called Greening the Grid. It's part of our 
uh, enhancing capacity for low emissions uh, development program. And this greening the grid, if you Google it, USAID greening the grid, you'll find an actual toolkit, a distributed PV toolkit that is out there with all sorts of resources and explanations about how to think about it. In fact, uh, I was reading through it this morning and one of, the, one of the ones I was talking about is the benefit of, uh, of having distributed generation along a distribution line, it actually prevents technical losses and compared to a system that does not have that. So there's a number of benefits for having embedded generation that are discussed in that, that toolkit. Um, we have other programs as well. We're supporting the green mini grid facility that is being run with uh, the African Development Bank, the uh, French Development Agency, AFD, uh, UK Development Agency, DFID. They're doing this in Kenya and other countries around the world, providing grant support to companies that are wanting to get into the embedded generation space. So there's a lot of resources available. You can look at our website, uh, Google Power Africa, and you'll be able to find access uh, to a lot of these. Um, we have a full toolbox as well that I'll uh, perhaps talk about a little bit later um, of lots of resources. But we're excited about this. We're involved in every aspect of the energy space, and this is an important one that we see as, as critical to the future of many different countries, and I think it'll be especially important in South Africa. So thank you. Thank you.